turn this chair in a little bit. And welcome you all to Inside the Actors Studio. I'm Charles Lipton. <clears throat> uh, this is really an honor and privilege to be here. I just want to say off the bat, because Tim and I are old friends, so it's really nice to be here with all of you. And excuse my uh, voice, I've been getting over a cold. So it's not like I'm Herbie from the Rudolph movie, I want to be a dentist, so just bear with me. Um, but Tim, it's great to see you. see you. And congratulations to you and Scott, of course, start off. Um, but everybody's very curious because before uh, you became high profile with your business and also with your political donations, uh, you were the founder of Quark, as I understand it. You borrowed two grand from your parents Plus to start an unspecified this. amount of money that I had in my checking account because I never balanced my checking account. Because <laughs> I really, I, I'm a mathematician, but I hate numbers when they represent dollar figures. And so, um, so yes, 2,000 plus something. Where did you get the number for 2,000? I mean, what did you need that money for um, in, in terms of the business model that you had? The business model was buying a printer. Um, <laughs> what had happened was uh, a local computer store had been selling a product that a lot of you probably have never heard of. It's called an Apple III. I think they sold 250,000 of them in the entire life of the product, but Apple had been promising a word processor for it and failed to deliver. And their excuse was kind of like the developer had a cold and couldn't get around to it. So we built a word processor and the um, store owner, in order to let me do that, gave me a computer on loan and in order to print out the manual, I needed a printer. So I wrote the manual, I wrote the product, um, I sent out all the letters. It was, for a while I did everything. My boyfriend at the time um, helped and later on came into the business, but uh, the $2,000 bought me a printer. Did you have any idea at the outset of what you were doing that you wanted to be as successful as you became? Was the drive and the motivation always inset in you? Um, okay, so what happened before I started this project was I had been working for a small company that ran out of money and laid me off. And I was depressed. I'd never been laid off before. Um, I interviewed with a couple of companies who said that they, that they didn't think I had the skill set necessary to work for them, which is kind of depressing. Um, and so rather than, and I actually looked back at my previous work history and what had happened was um, I'd worked on my own a number of times. I worked for HP for a while. Um, they closed my division, and so I left. I worked for this company, um, and they downsized. Actually, I worked for another company. I wasn't laid off, but what happened was the president of the company ran off with the secretary and all the money, and so everybody <laughs> came in one day, and we had no place to work. Um, so the, the moral that I picked up from that, because I'd also done some consulting, was when I worked for somebody else, bad things happened. And when I worked for me, everything <laughs> seemed to go okay. And so the idea that I would start my own company didn't seem that far-fetched, and the two companies that uh, said that I didn't have the skill set to work for them are no longer in existence. Oh, uh, which, is, which is nice to say, right? Uh, <laughs> When you talk about those early setbacks, do you consider those to be some of the, the greater failures of your business career? Oh, oh, there's so many great failures. Um, <laughs> you don't learn anything from success. Like success almost poisons you um, because what happens is if something's successful, you tend to repeat it whether it's relevant or not. But uh, no, I think the biggest failure I had was the guy I started the company with, my boyfriend at the time. Um, basically said, when are we going to become fabulously wealthy? And so I decided that one of the things I could do was um, build a hard disk drive. Um, it was clever at the time, because hard disk drives, um, prices had plummeted. Of course, the established companies did a better job. But it uh, was my first experience at losing a million dollars. And at the time, I didn't have a million dollars to lose. <laughs> and so that involved downsizing the company, laying friends off, um, and it kind of gave me a lot more care going forward about how I made business decisions. But that failure was one of the many important failures I've been through. 
But when you left the company in 2000, what did that do to you? Obviously, it was a, a great financial windfall, but what did that do to your professional headset? Um, I'd been doing Quark for 19 years, I think, at that point. So I was really ready to do something else. Um, and so I traveled, I snowboarded uh, a lot, and eventually I just discovered that my ego structure, the way I decide whether I'm a good person or not, whether I'm a, pr a productive person, is based almost exclusively on writing code. And if I do not get to write code for an extended period of time, I kind of feel like I'm a failure. So eventually I got back into code writing and I built a little social networking website that many of you know probably called Connection. Um, but I had to do that. I really had to because I couldn't retire. I don't think I know how to retire. I, I love doing that kind of thing too much. I love science and mathematics. Don't you still, don't you still do that some, you know? Constantly. Like it's a, it, you, you like to do that to relax. I do that to relax. <laughs> I, there are, are um, mathematical proofs and theorems in the um, outgiving notebook that I have with me that, on some new project I'm working on. I will make sure not to mix it up with mine, which just has doodles <laughs> and my room number in it so that I don't forget it. Is there anything, though, that, that you miss from, uh, obviously you said you did it for 19 years, uh, but what is it that you miss other than the code writing? Is there that... Uh, I, I don't miss... Quark at its peak was about 300 to 350 people. And so at the end, actually, that was one of the reasons that I left, is I couldn't write code anymore because I was involved in managing projects all over the world. So I would once a month spend about a week in Germany with the teams there, and spend, there was a team in Chicago and kind of all over the place. And um, so that really was not hard to walk away from. That was a relief to walk away from. Um, the things I miss about it are um, the challenges from my intellectual peers in the programming department. I miss that a lot. Um, but I do not miss the business part. So in uh, 1992, so eight years prior to selling Quark, uh, there was the passage of Colorado's Amendment 2. Mm -hmm. And that's what spurred you on to start the Gill Foundation. So explain to all of us what Amendment <clears throat> 2 was. Um, amendment 2 was a piece of legislation that was in vogue at trying to pass at the time, which basically put in the Constitution something that forbade municipalities or the state from granting equal rights based on sexual orientation. And so in one fell swoop, the citizens of Colorado decided that Aspen, Denver, it was Boulder, there's a, a variety of cities that had passed non-discrimination ordinances, and those were irrelevant. And so that was appealed over time to the Supreme Court. The, uh, actually, one of my first pieces of philanthropy, which is not terribly well documented, um, is there was a move to get businesses who were coming to Colorado out of Colorado um, to have them cancel their conventions or whatever. And one of the things that we did in Colorado as Quark was we had a conference that we held there for all our major um, customers. So it was people like Time and Newsweek and Business Week and on and on and on. And I had, in kind of a fit of depression, gone into my business partner, Fred, and he said, well, what you have to do is promise to give a million dollars away to combat discrimination. And so in front of um, this group, um, I mentioned, because some of them had called and said, you know, we, we don't want to come to Colorado because you're evil and you passed Amendment 2. And I said, no, no, come here and we'll take a vote amongst our customers about whether we want to hold the conference in Colorado in future years. And so, I made a not completely unbiased speech about the fact that if Colorado passed Amendment 2, we really shouldn't be holding our get-togethers there. And I also mentioned just in passing that I was going to give a million dollars away to fight discrimination. And of course, silly Tim, who didn't want to be in the press, 
that was in front of Newsweek and Time and the LA <laughs> Times. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, uh, I, I walk off the stage and someone from, I think the LA Times came up and says, so can we write about this? And I went, well, I guess so. And so that was kind of my first um, point at which I appeared in major ways in mainstream media. Before did, that, it had all been tech publications. Did that make you nervous? Um, no, it actually doesn't. Um, it tends to make everyone around me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> So one of the more unorthodox uh, programs of the, the Gill Foundation is the Gay and Lesbian Fund uh, for Colorado. Uh, it has gay and lesbian in the title, however, it doesn't fund maybe what many of us would consider to be uh, typical gay or lesbian groups. So explain the strategy behind that. Um, well, originally it was the, I'm trying to remember how we did it originally, it was the Gill Foundation's Gay and Lesbian Fund for Colorado. And what happened was, because the idea was really, at the time, I think there was a report that four, it was either 40 or 60 percent of people claimed they didn't know anyone gay in Colorado. And I'm mm -hmm. going, well, that's stupid. Um, and we can fix that. And we fix it by building something that's a lot like a corporate giving program, like what Nike does. So Nike isn't funding um, people on issues related to shoe construction. Nike is funding races. They're funding things that have a much broader um, recognition in the community. And so the Gay and Lesbian Fund for Colorado was very much a way of saying that gay people are part of your community too, and they're giving in these ways. And so it was another view of gay people besides what the news ran. And the news would come to Gay Pride, and they would find whoever had the most outrageous costume, and that was what was on the nightly news, and that was everyone's exposure to gay. Um, so. It's worked out fairly well. Um, we require that they have non-discrimination policies. Uh, that's going to have to be ratcheted up a notch because we now have non-discrimination statewide in Colorado. Uh, but it really is essentially advertising to the straight community for the gay community, saying that we all share the same basic values. We all look at the world in the same way, and we all want the same things for our community. Is that the uh, same principle for outgiving? Um, what, what got all of this started? I mean, what, what are you hoping to achieve by um, pulling all these smart, beautiful, wonderful people into the same room? Um, well, no. Outgiving, which was started um, by me, and, and uh, it was an idea from me and Tom Riley, which we had over far too many drinks at some convention <laughs> somewhere. Um, and Tom, for those of you who don't know Tom Riley, he uh, was one of the founders of Digital Queers, now works on the TED conferences. Um, but I had no peers. The number of donors giving at my level in Colorado to gay causes was zero. And so the objective for me, in a purely selfish way, was to build a peer group. And we discovered early on that you when, when we first put this together, I said, well, we can teach donors, by, which, by we I meant you know, someone we get, not us, because we were just new in the business too, about the art of philanthropy. And what we discovered when we got a focus group of donors together was that they already knew it all and that there was nothing to learn. And therefore, we couldn't actually teach it, but we could perhaps illustrate some examples of how that's done. And of course, eventually everyone realizes that there's always something to learn. Um, and this conference in many ways. It's partially it's a peer group, but I mean, in some ways, this is an extended board of advisors for me. That, uh, that there are two really key things that the Gill Foundation has done that came out of this conference. And the first was walking down the hall, talking to an older donor from San Francisco, who isn't here, by the way. Um, and he said, you know, Tim, as I get older, I get more and more afraid of giving away money because I might need it as I, as I age. And I went, wow, I can't let that happen to me. And so as a result of that, I gave away 60% of my net worth to the Gill Foundation. So the endowment for the Gill Foundation was essentially something that was inspired by a donor at one of these conferences. And then the other one was uh, the political out, outgiving conference where Tim Wu and a very handsome lesbian whose name I do not currently recall. 
I thought it might have been, actually. <laughs> And I was going to ask you this morning whether this was Marianne, whether it was, was you or not, because, uh, but uh, Marianne and Tim Wu are responsible for the political outgiving conferences, because they just came up to me at the end of one of the philanthropic ones and said, you need to do this for politics. And I said, hmm. And we announced it, I think, right there on the spot, basically, that we were going to. And uh, it's been another successful thing that we've done. And Marianne, you'll never forget that again. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually kind of up at night saying, was this Marianne? I, and I, I, I texted Tim Wu at what was probably 4 o'clock in the morning for him. But from the philanthropy side, uh, which is more about probably building up, how do you evaluate uh, the good works that you're doing? You know, one of the things you learn about that is that in politics, evaluating success and failure is incredibly easy because either people get elected or they don't, either mm -hmm. laws pass or they don't, and in philanthropy it's much harder. And what constitutes success depends very much on the area you're in, but in some ways the, the thing that I like best is risk. And so if someone has a new idea that's never been tried, I'm vastly more interested in that than in in funding the same old thing. Even though um, the failure rate should, will be non-zero, um, in, in politics, just as an example of the principle, it's really easy to pick a slate of candidates that will be on our side and will win. And you can have a 100% win rate. And it's also really easy to pick a, a slate of candidates that are against us, they're bad, evil people, you can fund them, and they're all going to going to win, and then your win rate is zero, but you can feel good about having done the right thing. And what makes me feel good is about picking something in the middle where my contribution made the difference between success and failure. And when you do that, you aren't going to have a 100% win rate. If, you have, if your win rate is too high, you aren't being risky enough. And so you really want to kind of ride that line between success and failure to push as many people who would have failed into success. And in philanthropy, you do the same thing. You try to find people with new ideas, novel approaches, um, or existing organizations. They don't have to be new organizations that are trying something new, and that actually they have a mechanism to evaluate it. An idea that doesn't have a mechanism to evaluate it is a flawed idea. Um, in business, we have a really simple way, which is whether it makes a profit or not. But if you look at many of the successful businesses, they'll put out an idea, it won't be quite right, they'll refine it, they'll iterate it by version two or three. In Quark Express's case, it was version three that really took off. Um, so for us in, in Quark, it was version three of Quark Express that took off and, and made all this money. Um, and the same thing is true in philanthropy, is that you want people who are innovators, who are thinkers, who are capable of changing direction um, to come up with the right solution. It takes great risk for great reward. So when you think about... The right amount of risk. The right amount, all right. So when you think about the Gill Foundation, what do you think the greatest success has been for it? Um, I think in some ways, there's, there's a lot of things that we've done that are very successful. This is one, and it's more than a success just because it's, you all give me great ideas I can steal. Um, it's a success because when people talk together, they figure out how to work together, and they figure out how to work in concert, and a small group of people working together is much more effective than a small group of people, each of whom are working separately. Are there ideas that you've tried out that have, that have failed? Things oh, that... yes, but we try not to remember those. No. Um, in business, it's, <laughs> it's funny. In business, I remember the ideas that fail really quite well. Um, in philanthropy, somehow I don't. Um, I, I think my memory is very peculiar. I, I tend not to remember events and people. I tend to re remember equations and things that can be derived from first principles. And so the answer would be no, I don't really remember that kind of thing. Uh, giving while living, is, is that the type of mantra that, from the example that you give from talking to that gentleman who said, you know, I don't know if I want to give away 
my, my funds anymore because I might need them. Is that what motivated you to give away 60% of your net worth? The well, that was what, that's what motivated me to give away 60% of the, my net worth, but the question is what time frame, now that mm -hmm. it's in the foundation, should it be given away over? And if giving away money is fun, then you can't have that fun after you're dead. And so you might as well <laughs> contrive to give, give it away now. And from, so from my point of view is that um, you know, the Gill Foundation 100 years from now won't be the premier gay and lesbian foundation. The Gill Foundation will be gone. And you can't predict the time of your death, but you can make a good guess. And so the intention is to spend the Gill Foundation down at a higher rate. It's not the 5% rate that foundations typically spend. We spend at a much higher rate because at some point the assets of the Gill Foundation should be zero. In 2000? No, there, there should be incredibly clever people, many of whom I hope are in this room, who will pick up and uh, carry on from where I leave off. In, in 2005, Gill Action was started. So mm -hmm. explain what Gill Action is. Um, Gill Action was kind of the final evolution of a process. When I started with philanthropy, I said, politics is icky. I don't want to give to politics. Um, is that the icky? Just, it's, yeah. it's icky. It's icky. It's icky. It's corrupt. Um, <clears throat> it's, of course, not as corrupt in America as it is in many, many other countries. But, um, and so there was a slow evolution where I did the kind of obvious things. Oh, this is a good candidate. They're good on our issues. I'll give them money. And they, they won or lost, but there was really no actual analysis on my part of whether they would win or, or lose. It was just whether they had the right position. And at some point, I started with a single advisor. I got another advisor when the, the first advisor um, went on to another job. And that just kept growing. That portfolio kept growing, and it kept becoming more strategic. Um, and more thoughtful, and eventually Gill Action was born. Now, when it comes to, uh, to donating, do you think of yourself or other people out there uh, to look at you as the type of mentor or a role model to follow in how they can you know, get called to action, whether it's politically or privately? People ask me from time to time who my role model is, and I don't have role models, and it's not because people don't do clever things. It's kind of like, okay, Tim's going to use a terrible snowboarding analogy. <laughs> um, when people say, what's your favorite ski resort? I don't have a favorite ski resort. I have favorite runs. And when people say, who's your, your mentor? I don't have mentors, but I, I know people that have done really clever things. And so I try to take all those clever things and piece them together. Um, and so there's no one person I look up to, but there's some, a lot of people that have done one or two things that I thought was really clever. Or in some cases, um, they've done something that's really not clever and that I can learn from that too. For, for you who, uh, you're an introvert, uh, and I know that this is hard for you. I told him as we were walking in, as I was walking in with him and Scott, I was gonna try and get him to cry. <laughs> You know, my Barbara Walters style up here. <laughs> um, but uh, for you, uh, is, is it hard to take a much more, uh, you know, center stage role uh, and, and have to uh, kind of lead the way for a lot of people uh, that may not have the opportunities that have been afforded you? You know, I, I used to, and I still sometimes do refer to myself as a pathological introvert, but... Um, what happened was when I had Quark, because I thought, well, that's one of the other silly things that the computer programmer thought when he started a, a multi-million dollar multinational corporation was that um, I would be able to just program and I wouldn't have to actually deal with people because <laughs> that's a big scary thing. And uh, it turns out that I did, and it turns out that uh, fortunately, the guy who ended up being my business partner after he bought out uh, my boyfriend after my boyfriend and I broke up. Um, or actually he bought him out and then my boyfriend and I broke up, but there was only like a one week difference. Um, and Fred had this wonderful kind of emotive style um, that I emulated and I, I don't have this kind of wonderful emotive style that, that Fred does, but, um, but I watched him and so, I simulate an extrovert really, really well. 
for short periods of time. And it's become more natural and it's become more easy, but um, fundamentally the difference between an introvert and an extrovert is how do you recharge? And I recharge by going and reading a book or playing with the computer or doing something that's very kind of just me centric right. where I don't have writing to actually, code writing code <laughs> the, writing code is a lovely escape so have you been able to balance to balance that better the fact that you're much more uh, on the radar screen for so many people as you say you know not having uh, been such a, a public figure before but now through the fact that you can be a lightning rod for issues when it comes to public policy do, do you like that? Do you like, you know, when people hear the name Tim Gill, they may shudder a little bit if they're on the other side? <laughs> if they're on the other side, they should shudder. It's good. Um, it's, it's not a matter of like or dislike. Um, you know, I could be much more public than I am, and from time to time people encourage me to do that, but I, the, the level of publicity I get now I'm, I'm fairly comfortable with. It doesn't consume huge amounts of my time. I mean, some of the things that the executive directors of um, the larger gay and lesbian organizations do, the amount of um, public exposure they have, I would never be able to tolerate. I would be a, sh I would be a quivering mass um, that would require too much people exposure. This is why I could never be a politician, is people say, Tim, you should go into politics. I'm going, oh no, I'd have to like be nice. Um, <laughs> Plus I, would, I would have to not honest. tell people, I'd ha right. I would have to not tell people what I thought um, all the time. And it's much more convenient to live a life where if someone says something stupid, I can hopefully politely say that it's um, non-ideal. With, uh, with being completely uh, you know, thankful for the present that we're all in right now, and uh, as far as we've come with the LGBT community, how, how do you see the advances in the future? I mean, you get to sit here today as a married man. and. Uh, you know, have all these wonderful people here for outgiving. How, do you see technology as the, the biggest connector that's now going to change the, the way of the future as, it, as we've seen how it's done so quickly over the past, you know, uh, less than 20 years? Well, technology, is cha technology changes the way society works. And if we, as a movement, can take advantage of that, then we're just in a, in a better position. Um, but we still have, I mean, it almost, it's not quite to the end game here in the United States. Um, it could all be over, not all be over, but um, be substantially over in 10 years, but it could also stretch out to another 30 or 40. Um, but outside of the US, there's an awful long way to go on this. So it's not like the problem is going away. And if you look at the Jewish community, uh, it's not like there are no with the black community, there are organizations that are necessary because the majority of people want to take minorities and put them in a little box, put them in a hierarchy where they're below um, the people that are in control. And so you have to be ever vigilant. So, all, so the character of organizations we have will change, um, but there will always be some gay and lesbian organizations necessary forever. When we talk about the, the LGBT community, what do you find to be the current strengths and where do you see current weaknesses? Um, I, I think we allowed our ability to, our, our ability to cope in the environment of Washington was never super, super great, but we allowed that to atrophy under Bush. Um, and we need to become much smarter about that. And that's not all kind of C4 politics things. It's things like working with, within agencies. It's making sure that uh, all of the, the policies are in place in the bureaucracy that um, take care of the special needs of gay and lesbian people. So, and, and increasingly trans, transgender people whose plight is that uh, they haven't had as many years of public exposure mm -hmm. for people to understand what they are, and so it's a bit scary. Um, but that's okay because you know, gay people were there once, transgender people have a higher hurdle to climb at this point, but I'm convinced they will. And, uh, and, and I think unfortunately sometimes shunned from within. I mean, from within the LGBT community for not even understanding. Yeah, one of the, one of the really early outgivings, uh, I'm trying to remember where it was, um, 
I think it was Ricky was uh, presenting on. Pardon? Connecticut, Connecticut um, was presenting on that. And, and you could see even within the donors there that they hadn't kind of thought through the issues mm -hmm. as well because they hadn't had the exposure. And so for us to be good allies to the transgender community, we have to make sure that the education is done here first and that we can all go out and be representatives for them because there are more of us than there are of them. When it comes to the, uh, the current strategies that are taking place right now to educate everyone around the country, mm -hmm. uh, what do you think are the strategies that are working, especially when it comes to uh, the, the phrase, the movable middle? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we lost Will and Grace, so. <laughs> I mean, it's really those kinds of pop culture, bits of pop culture exposure that... Um, you think shows that, like Glee could be helping? Oh, uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure Glee is helping. Um, but it's all those kinds of pop cultural exposure that, I mean, you're never going to be able to go out. It's never going to be cost effective to go out to uh, certain places in the U.S. And, and, and do any kind of direct education. And so the more that that comes through pop culture, uh, the better off we are. Uh, the biggest keys to success that you consider uh, to be intangibles, over, or, you know, or tangible, excuse me, over the next five years? Oh, gosh. I told you you had to cry by the end of this. So. <laughs> um, because I don't have an answer? Uh -huh. um, <laughs> Whatever it takes. If I wink, you cry. Remember, that's the code. <laughs> no, I, I, I think donors acting in cooperation is hugely important. Um, you know, I, I think the, the thing that makes us succeed ultimately is that we're fighting for our lives. We're fighting to be able to be who we are, and the people mm -hmm. who are fighting against us are not fighting for their lives. It's not as... It's not a core issue to all but a few crazies. And for us, it's a core issue. And it's about being able to be who we are, being able to enjoy our lives like everybody else. And so I think our commitment is going to be much stronger than their commitment, and that's really what's going to let us win. Is it uh, heavily relied upon straight allies? I think any minority has to make sure that it has allies. Um, Things work better. I mean, in, in Colorado, we sit at every progressive table. And we're there for them, and they're there for us. And that's one of the things that really lets us win. Is there a point where, you, when you look back at the, the work, uh, is there going to be a time where you feel that you've succeeded? Um, there'll be a time, hopefully, about the time the foundation runs out of money, that I'll be able to step back and. Um, do other things. I have other passions in computer science and mathematics that I would like to pursue, but uh, the job will never be done. If the job is never going to be done, uh, will the, the mission is always going to be the same then for the Yale Foundation? Mission, the, mission cha the mission changes um, just because conditions change a little bit. But Well, the core mission, the mission statement, is equal opportunity for all people regardless of sexual orientation or gender expression or identity. Um, and that never changes. And finally, what's the core thought that you hope everyone, when they take off and they leave tomorrow uh, and have to go back to their daily lives, uh, what do you want them to leave with after attending this weekend? Try something new. And, and you know, in the end, by you learning more things, you'll be able to try more new things. So. All right, guys, I want to say thank you to Tim Gill. I want to say thank you to all of you for being such an attentive audience. Mm -hmm. and, yep. and you didn't cry. No, I didn't cry. No, he didn't cry. <laughs>